GearNetwork.com. The following is a presentation of the Gear Radio Network. Hey, this is Skip Winger, and you're listening to the All Bets Are Off podcast with Robbie Vegas. What's up, Rock Soldiers? This is the rock star Robbie Vegas with another episode of the All Bets Are Off podcast. Before I get started today, I just would like to remind you all to please give us a follow on social media at ABAOPod on X, Instagram, and Facebook. Today, my guest is Dave Julian. Uh, I actually met Dave for the first time when I was a teenager. He was in a band at the time called Last Conservative, and today we'll get into that a little bit, but really we're going to be talking a lot of 80s hair metal and Ace Freely. And why are we talking Ace Freely? Because Dave Julian is one of the co-writers on 10,000 Volts and Cosmic Heart on the new Ace Freely record, 10,000 Volts. So uh, hang out with us for a little bit, let us know what you think, and make sure you give Dave a follow on his social media afterwards. And we are going to jump into this interview right now by taking a listen to... Cosmic Heart. I've traveled all this world and tasted life to the max. Met the kings and queens, but it never changed me. I've seen the good and the bad and the strangest of things. Sometimes I lost my So, Dave, I just want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here on the All Better Off podcast, man. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for having me. I, I really appreciate you having me on. Of course, man. Of course. And uh, I'm going to do things the uh, same way I did with Steve Brown, whereas uh, I started a little bit backwards and we backtracked because uh, the big news going on right now is that the new Ace Freely album, 10,000 Volts, is kicking ass. And you were actually involved in that project. Yeah, I was I was very, very lucky. Um, and it's really because of Steve Brown um, that I got involved. So I was um, looking around for somebody to co-write with. I had some instrumentals that I had done and I probably about 15 or 20 songs. And I sent a link to Steve Brown and, um, you know, didn't expect to hear anything from him. And um, I was actually asleep one time and he called me and he's like, Hey man, it's Steve. And I'm like, Steve who? And he goes, that's Steve Brown. I was like, Hey, what's going on? He goes, I don't know if he knew that I was so out of it when I, cause I probably sounded like it. And um, <laughs> he's like, Hey, I, I just checked out your stuff. I really liked it, man. Like, what are you doing? And I'm like, I'm, I'm doing nothing. Like, that's why I kind of contacted you, you know? And he goes, uh, he goes, oh, man. He goes, I really like this stuff. I think a couple of these might be good for Ace. And I go, uh, Ace, I was kind of like Ace who? And I was thinking, like, like, I don't think there's any other Aces. And I was like, you're, you're working on, like, Ace Freely? And he's like, yeah. He goes, I'm working, you know, I'm working with him on his record. And I was like, oh, yeah, that would be great. So I sent him the stuff he kind of gave me some notes and things on like, you know, changes and things that he wanted and that Ace wanted. I sent him, I think three or four songs. One of them wasn't going to end up on there um, that I really liked. And I was kind of bummed about that. And then he was like, Hey man, I don't know if any of these are going to make it. So I was like kind of desperate and I'm like, all right, well, you know, what's your take on stuff, you know? And like, what do you think? And he goes, well, kind of talked to me a little bit about what he was looking for and i said all right well give me the weekend to try to come up with one more thing and that one more thing was ten thousand volts oh wow so it was wow. kind of like you know like all right well this is it i don't think any of this stuff's gonna make it on there and you know mm -hmm. and, and then once and as far as making it on there once steve played it for ace and then you know played like it was kind of like an early version kind of had the riff in there, but it didn't have like the pre-course and some other things. And then what would happen is over time I would get like, you know, a text from Steve saying, Hey man, we need a pre-chorus, something like this or something like this. And I'd be like, okay, well, let me try to come up with something. And then I would, you know, work on it for a couple of days. And I'd be like, well, what about this? And 
and they liked it. And then he'd be like, okay, well, Ace wants this and this change and this change and they don't like this, but they like this. So over time, you know, we kind of like formed it into the final, but it was, it was, it was pretty much there, you know, from the, from the beginning. But then obviously once Ace kind of took a listen to it, he had changes and things that he wanted. Now the other song, so the, the original three or four that I sent, one of them actually did make it on there, a second one. And that was one of the original ones I sent, and that was Cosmic Heart, which I think is the third track. That song, pretty much they used, you know, like it was, it was pretty similar to my idea originally. And it, it didn't change a lot on it. But obviously, Steve and Ace wrote the top line part. So I was just involved musically with it. And then, you know, Steve and Ace did the you know, vocals on it. Uh, I thought it was really cool that you said you almost didn't have a song on the record. But then when you did, it was 10,000 Volts, which became the title track of the record. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's really, to be quite honest with you, that's really Stephen Ace. Because <laughs> I was like, you know, I was just like, hey, you know, I got some other stuff, you know, and I was kind of floundering a bit. And the one thing I'll say about Steve is he's been very helpful in terms of, um, you know, kind of helping me along with my writing, you know, because mm-hmm. I had, you know, I mean, I had some decent ideas. I mean, he's, he's very complimentary, but quite honestly, they, they needed some work. And, Mm -hmm. but I think he saw something in a few of them and, you know, it really came down to what, you know, ultimately it's Ace's decision. And he, uh, was nice enough to, you know, you know, even listen to a couple of things and, you know, worked out pretty nice for me. So I was, you know, very fortunate, pretty lucky actually to be involved, but you know, it was, um, you know, I I think a lot of it had to do with Steve kind of helping me out with, you know, the kind of the ins and outs, like, like he he would, he would, uh, it's funny because it he would be like, dude, you don't write any bridges. Like it just, it's just a guitar solo over either the verse or the chorus or like whatever he goes, you, you got to write like a bridge. And he's like, you know, try some different key, key changes, this and then do that. You know, I had like, I don't know, this kind of geeky music shit, but like I had like the circle of fifths out and I'm trying to figure out, okay, if, you know, if, if the song's in, in this key and, and I want to do a bridge, I could try this, that, you know, I was just like trying all these different things and, and, um, you know, luckily I had the time to kind of experiment with it. So I'm hoping to do some more stuff with Steve and, and, you know, in the future, we've kind of talked about it a little bit, but, um, you know, it was definitely a great experience for me working with him. And, and, and then obviously ultimately getting to meet Ace out of it was, was fantastic. Now, is, is this, uh, were you growing up like a, a Kiss fan or anything like that? So was this like kind of a holy shit moment or? Yeah, there was definitely a lot of that. I mean, quite honestly, it's funny. A lot of uh, interviews I see with Steve, he's like Eddie Van Halen and Ace Frehley. I'm kind of the same way. The only mm-hmm. difference, though, for me is is because of my age. I mean, I'm still you know, up there. But in terms of my age, I kind of – my first kind of introduction to Kiss was more during the, like, Lick It Up, you know, um, Animalize era. So it was yeah. interesting. Like when I was a kid, like, you know, that was like my introduction to Kiss. It was really no makeup. I mean, I was aware of the makeup. Mm-hmm. But then I was I played in a band with a, a friend of mine in high school. And he's like, he goes, why do you want to play all these like newer Kiss songs? I'm like, he's like, what about like some older stuff? And I'm like, well, I really haven't heard it. And he's like, mm-hmm. oh, you're missing out, man. So then he kind of, uh, my friend Rod, he kind of basically said, you're, you got to go back and listen to this, this, you know, live one, live two, this album, this album, this album. And then obviously once I did that, I was hooked. So yeah, it was a, it was one of those moments where you're just kind of like, I can't believe this is happening. That's amazing. And it's got to feel great right now because Ace is tearing up the charts and, and he's, he's like topping every rock chart you can think of at the moment. So that's, that's cool that you have your hand in that. Yeah. Like I said, it was, you know, I mean, I got, I, I know I got to give Steve kind of a lot of the credit in that for, for kind of believing in some of the stuff that I did. I mean, he was very complimentary about it, but you know, it needed some work and, I was just glad, you know, he was able to make it happen. And, and mm-hmm. um, yeah, very fortunate opportunity. And, uh, yeah, it's it's actually doing all right, which is cool. You know, I mean, you know, a lot of the newer rock stuff, I, there's a lot of stuff that I like, but I feel like there's just kind of like missing kind of 80s element from, you know, certain like newer rock that comes out. I think Frontiers, the label Frontiers has kind of uh, done some really nice stuff with that. But I just feel like there's a kind of an untapped kind of area and it's it's probably a small audience but you know for me i was i kind of grew up more on like you know kiss van halen acdc stuff like that and um like rat i love rat you know so mm-hmm. it's those types of bands that like you don't really hear as much of that influence in some of the newer music and i feel like people still kind of would like to hear that influence so that's kind of what i that's kind of my sweet spot is like more of the 
kind of Van Halen, ACDC, you know, I love Thin Lizzy, you know, stuff like that. So, yeah, no, you're, you're absolutely right. And that's why that music I think has, has made the huge comeback that it's made with a lot of these bands having the biggest tours of the year, every year and things like that, which brings me to, um, you know, my next question is, and I could be wrong on this, but you also work with Jack Russell, correct? Yeah, not directly, but through Alessandro, who is kind of the, um, I think he just recently left Frontiers, but uh, Alessandro Del Vecchio is kind of the, you know, the head honcho as far as like the A&R slash in-house production side of Frontiers for a long time. Mm -hmm. And he uh, ended up, I think it was three songs ended up on the new Jack Russell, um, Tracy Guns record, the Russell Guns record, which I think turned out really great. And I love what Tracy Guns did with the guitar stuff. Um, I just think he did a really cool kind of cool tone. And I think Tracy's an amazing player. Um, So I was kind of happy with what he did on that and, and the way Jack sang it. I thought it was great. So yeah, I was fortunate to get on that too. Well, my, my follow-up question to that is the same as uh, what I asked you about Ace. Were you uh, a great white fan growing up? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. (laughs) <laughs> oh, yeah. So, yeah. so you got to check off a couple boxes from from bands that you like that you end up you know working with yeah that kind of is uh it's kind of a weird story but i had done a lot of I, i'm not a huge country fan but i had done a lot of country session work for a producer a friend of mine in nashville and i really tried to do writing there because i felt like well there's still guitar playing and country music mm-hmm. i didn't really think there was an opportunity to do rock music and then finally um I was actually talking to my wife and she's like, why don't you just do what you want? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And I said, well, I, I'd really love to do rock music. This was like four or five years ago. And she's like, well, just do rock music. Like who cares if it doesn't go anywhere? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, don't worry about charts and this and that. And I said, well, you know, uh, all right. So I started writing some rock stuff and my first um, kind of contact or person that I would kind of wanted to write for was uh, Phil Nero, who is, um, he's like a Buffalo guy and, and, uh, I don't know if he's from Buffalo, but he's, you know, basically was in the band Talus, which is a Buffalo band with Billy Sheehan, Mm -hmm. um, the band that Billy was in before he went off with Billy Roth. And, you know, being in the Buffalo area, I was a huge Talus fan. So I get to see Talus open for Iron Maiden. And I was just blown away by how great the singer uh, Phil Nero was. So my first thing was like, okay, well, I'm doing music that I, I don't even know what to do with this. So the first person I contacted was Phil. And he actually came over to my house and we did some writing. And uh, unfortunately, he ended up uh, getting throat cancer and he passed away a couple oh, of years wow. ago. So while I thought he was just kind of like not into the project and I wasn't hearing from him, it was actually because he was sick. Mm-hmm. And I, I didn't even realize it. So of the, the songs that I pitched to Phil Nero, there were two songs that he didn't like that ended up on the Jack Russell record. Oh, wow. So it was kind of like I, I, I pivoted from trying to work with him to... Uh, contacting Frontiers and Alessandro was great about kind of taking a listen to my stuff and mm-hmm. taking a listen to things. And then, you know, once that stuff started, then I was like, all right, well, I'm going to, I'd send stuff out to a few more people. And one of those people was Steve Brown. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, but he was, you know, I mean, I sent out to a lot of people and he was one of the, he was one of the only people that got back to me. So I was really <laughs> kind of lucky. I mean, I was, I was basically doing nothing. So it was nice of him to, you know, kind of take me under his wing and, and kind of help me out, you know, in terms of getting me involved and, and to be involved with the ACE record. I mean, on top of it, it was just, <laughs> holy cow, you know, but, but I love, I love what Steve did in terms of the production and, and kind of the direction he took it in. And those guys, ACE and Steve seem to have a great kind of collaborative uh, chemistry. So I think it worked out really good. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, um, you know, you kind of segued into where I was going to go next with the conversation, which is Buffalo, because I remember you from Last Conservative. Um, I I probably met you when I was like 17 years old or so. And, um, you know, TJ actually produced my last release and which is how this this podcast came about. So my question is, is from Buffalo to Nashville, how did that happen? Well, what happened was, is before Last Conservative, which was around 2005, six, seven, we actually mm-hmm. opened for Bon Jovi in 2005, I think it was, in Buffalo, five mm-hmm. or six, for the Have a Nice Day tour. Yeah, I remember. But prior to that, I was in a different band, and that band had some interest from a guy named Richard Goder. This is all kind of in the weeds, but this guy, Richard Goder, started Sire Records with Seymour Stein. You know, Sire had, like, Blondie and the Talking Heads and all this stuff. Mm-hmm. Seymour Stein's partner was Richard Goder. They were kind of the guys that started the label. 
Richard loved my band before Last Conservative and tried to get us a deal with Columbia. Okay. So it ended up falling through. But in the meantime, uh, our singer in, in this, this is pre Last Conservative, the singer in the band I was in before that was like, hey, I have some friends in New York. And um, they're producers, and, and the one guy had an A&R deal with, like, Interscope. And they were kind of interested in the band also. So we went to New York to meet with them. I walk into their recording studio. They had a recording studio right near Yankee Stadium. Mm -hmm. I walk into the recording studio, and they go, hey, let me show you the B studio. There's a guy in there doing editing. And I open the door, and it was a guy from a band in Buffalo that I knew. And it was my buddy Mike. His name's Mike Shimshak. And I was like, Mike, like, what the hell are you doing here? He goes, Oh, I work with these guys. And I had no idea because I had lost touch with them because uh -huh. I hadn't played, you know, in, in this Buffalo band that we used to, you know, play and uh, play. Our bands used to play together at a club in Buffalo. And that was like in like the mid, late 90s. So I was like, what are you doing here? And, and this guy ended up going to Nashville and becoming a producer in Nashville. And he did some some, he, you know, he worked with some pretty big writers in Nashville and one day he calls me and he's like, hey, man, he goes, I don't have any money for session guys. Do you want to just play on these country songs for free? I go, sure, I'll try it. And he goes, uh, I go, I don't really play country music. He goes, just think like Skinner, 38 Special, it's fine, whatever. You know what I mean? Just Southern Rocket kind of thing. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of how I got my start, like doing like uh, recording. It was more like session work. And I, I bought a bunch of gear. It was actually John Resnick from the Goo Dolls gear. Um somebody that worked at his studio was kind of fire sailing it. And I got some mics and some pro tool, a pro tools rig and stuff. That was like John Resnick. I bought it off, off of this guy that was selling it and at the studio. And that's kind of how I started. It was just doing country session work. And I was just, you know, and then I like picked up a mandolin and kind of learned how to play the mandolin. I picked up a banjo and kind of learned how to play the banjo a little bit, but ultimately I wasn't great at writing country music and I wanted to do writing. I didn't want to just do session work. Yeah. So, you know, after probably about five or six years, I was just, I just started doing more writing and I was like, okay, if I can, if I can learn how to engineer to play guitar, that's great. Okay. If I can learn how to actually like write a full song, at least an instrumental, that would be great. And then if I could learn how to make that at least sound good. So it sounds like professional, like a professional mix, that would be great too. So over the course of like, I mean, quite honestly, it's been like 15 years. I just oh. kind of learned how to do all these different things up to the point where i could produce like a finished rock song it's an instrumental mm -hmm. and i could just kind of go off and like pitch that to people to write the top line you know the vocals and the melody and the lyrics and the melody yeah so i figured that part out i don't have a great voice but i can sing in tune both of my kids actually have perfect pitch which is weird because <laughs> i don't my wife actually has it i don't have it so <laughs> it's kind of weird when your kids are like really tiny and they sing way better than you do but What's interesting is I now have gone, and this is a little controversial, but I've now gone to the part where I'm starting to write more melodies on stuff, but instead of using my voice, I'm actually changing it to somebody else's voice using AI software. Hmm. So instead of just like singing and you hear like my frog voice, I'm actually running it through AI software where I can pick, I can either create a vocal print that's like somebody you would know, yeah. or I can create a vocal print of just like a rock singer with a good voice you've never heard of. And I'm actually mm. using that to now pitch my melody ideas because it's amazing how much better. Because I kind of learned when I was doing the music, if I send somebody something and it sounds like shit, like if the drums are terrible and the mix is terrible, they don't think it's a good song. But it's amazing how much better they think the song is if it sounds really good. You know what I mean? <laughs> so what I noticed, and, and this is happening even in the country stuff because I started doing tracks. You know, there's always a track guy in country music that they don't want to give writing credit to or, or a percentage of the publishing to. I yeah. did some track work for people. And what I noticed is they said, hey, when I just did like a crappy, you know, voice memo on my phone and sent it to my publisher, they didn't like the song. Six months later, I send them your finished version. And now they think it's the greatest song ever. But nothing's changed other than the recording. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah, when yeah. I, you know, and I'd always heard that from A&R guys when I was trying to get a deal. It's like you always want your stuff to not sound like a demo. It's got to sound finished or else nobody's going to think it's any good. Even if it's a great song, mm -hmm. you could turn no, and stare to heaven, but if it sounds like shit, they're going to say, this is not a good song. You yeah, know? no, it makes total sense to me. Total sense to me. Yeah. So that's kind of how I've progressed over the years is always trying to up my, you know, engineering <laughs> uh, ability, my writing ability, you know, uh, mixing ability, you know, mastering my own stuff, trying to get it to a point. Um, I can even send you a couple things when we're done that kind of like, okay, here's what it sounds like before it goes to 
somebody to try to write on. Now, uh, again, I'll, I'll bring it back to um, the last conservative thing, because that's the first time I, I saw you. You had, you know, some pretty good success with last conservative before going on to do what you're doing now. Are you, you know, specifically in the market for writing for other people or are you going to be releasing or have you been releasing your own music along the, you know, along the way? No, it's just writing for other people. I like that a lot. I, you know, I, um, I kind of got burnt out on the touring thing, especially, you know, there's a difference between touring when you're in a van and touring when you're in a bus and mm. making no money. <laughs> it's like, it was, <laughs> I mean, it was a great experience and I got to play some really big shows, but it was, it was, it was you know, mentally I couldn't handle it after being on the road so much after a while. So, Mm -hmm. and then I'm like, well, if I release my own stuff, that's cool. But, you know, you kind of got to get out there and tour and support it a little bit and, and try to do some stuff with it. And I just, you know, so for me, it's all about writing with other people and for other people. I I really enjoy that. Do you think that uh, at any point in time, you and TJ would, uh, you know, do a few more last conservative shows or, or is that off the table? No, I'm always up for that. Um, we, you know, usually they're in, in the Buffalo area and it's been uh, for charity. Like mm. we, we used to do a show on December 23rd every year that was for charity. Um, no, I, you know, I, I really like those guys and we still keep in contact. So, I mean, I, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to play out regularly, but definitely one offs, you know, maybe one or two shows a year or something like that. I would, I would always enjoy doing that because I, I, I mean, TJ is so talented. Mm-hmm. I mean, he's mm-hmm. got such an energy to him still to this day. I mean, it's, you know, it's one of these guys. It's just, I was always amazed by his, his talent and his energy. So for me, I, I mean, if that, you know, the call comes, uh, I would definitely be interested for sure to, to, to do a one-off. Yeah, I, I will definitely second that on TJ. Um, he really, on my last release, brought my songs to life. He's He's got a very creative, creative mind, <laughs> and uh, it's really cool to see it um, in action, so to speak. Um, but my next question to you would be, we touched on a few bands that you liked growing up, but who was like your, your Mount Rushmore, like your, your top four bands where you were like, I'm going to be a guitar player because of these guys. Very simple. Uh, Randy Rhodes with Ozzy. I'd say number one is Van Halen Roth era. Mm. Um, that was the, that was the biggest thing. And that's, I mean, 99% of the guitar players that are my age, that's, that's their deal, right? It's Eddie Van Halen. So um, obviously, Randy Rhodes, a close second. Those two Ozzy albums, you know, Blizzard and Diary, are just, you know. Um, big fan of Warren D. Martini of Rat. Yeah. Uh, obviously, Ace and Kiss. Very, and these aren't ranked in any order. These are just, you know, ones I'm thinking of. Uh, mm-hmm. Definitely um, Ace and, and Kiss and his stuff. That's definitely very high up there. Um, I'm trying to think of the fifth one that I really like. I mean, quite honestly, when I was younger, I didn't appreciate Jimmy Page's playing as much as I do now. Mm-hmm. And it's less for like the, cause you know, when you grow up in the, in the shredder era kind of thing, I was my, based on my age, I'm, I'm kind of like in between shredder and grunge. So mm-hmm. for me, it's like, you know, like when I started playing, it was all about guitar solos. And then when I got to an age where I could play out live, it was not about guitar solos. So yeah. I was in a very strange spot. That's why this whole thing is just so odd to me now, because I always, I mean, there was probably a 10 year period where I don't think I played any guitar solo unless it was a melody, like something you hear on a Weezer record. Oh, wow. I, I, you know, I did not play the style of music that I played now mm-hmm. for probably 20 years. Oh, wow. So it was kind of like, you know, I was in a band. I was, because if you listen to like Last Conservatives music, I mean, it's, it, it, it's not like 10,000 volts, you know, it's not that style. Right. It's, 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 it's the decade after, right? Yeah. So, for me, as I got older, I, I started to appreciate players more like Jimmy Page and Frampton. And, and we're now talking like in my early to mid 20s. So it wasn't really the formative years. It was more like in my 20s. And mm-hmm. I really, you know, got into like Frampton and Jimmy Page, like those two guys. And then eventually more into like Jeff Beck and, and stuff where I was like, you know, kind of expanding my uh, horizons as a guitar player. I never really expanded them as far as playing. I'm pretty much kind of like a one trick pony. It's like like (laughs) rock music. Here you go. I also love Billy Duffy from the cult too. I think he's fantastic. Yeah. That's one that you don't hear about enough. Actually, I don't think he gets enough credit. I don't think Warren D. Martini, I I think with Warren D. Martini, he gets credit, but the problem is, is that, you know, he kind of walked away from things at a fairly early age. So he never kind of really kept going. I, I think, 
you know, it's like um, a good example of a band is like the Cars, right? The Cars are just an amazing band, but they went away for so long that people tend to forget them sometimes. Yeah. But that first Cars record is just incredible. I feel pe- I feel like that happened with Warren Martini, where he kind of walked away and people don't realize. I mean, I love J.K. Lee, too. Like his time in Ozzy, I thought he was incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, you know, uh, Billy Duffy, I just... I mean, I, I go back to Southern Death Cult or whenever he started and have listened all the way up, and I've just always enjoyed his playing. The the cool thing about talking to you about this stuff is, well, one, I'm also a big Warren D. Martini fan, and uh, I could go on all day about that. But knowing the, you know, from Last Conservative to 10,000 Volts and knowing who TJ's inspirations are, you know, you two in the same band almost doesn't make sense to me because you're very like hair metal like I am. Mm-hmm. And TJ's very counting crows. So it's one of those things where it's like, how, how do you end up in last conservative with such like that style being your favorite thing? You know? Yeah. You know, I, it's funny. I do. It's funny because even like in the grunge era stuff, I still, I was not a huge Nirvana fan. I was more into like stone temple pilots because you could hear like the Zeppelin influence and their influences and I think that's why I gravitated towards like a band like Stone Temple Pilots more than I did a band like Nirvana. It, mm-hmm. Because anything that came in where, because if you think about it, like Stone Temple Pilots are really not a grunge band. They're really mm-hmm. not. You know what I mean? They don't really fit that mold. They're more of a rock band. Yeah. And I think they would probably, I think they've probably said that before. I mean, the DeLeo brothers, especially like, I can't tell you like Dean and Robert to me are so talented and, and um, I didn't realize how talented Robert was. I mean, I always knew he was a great bass player, but like he did this thing with Rick Beato where he's like playing guitar and talking about writing certain things. And like, he's a good guitar player. I mean, a really good guitar player and just a great overall musician. I think both those guys are, mm-hmm. So they didn't have that kind of thing where they were just like, you know, banging out core, not that it's a bad, but more of a, you know, if you think of Nirvana, it's more of a punk influence, almost like a Ramones kind of thing. Yes, that it is a classic rock thing. Now, the thing about Kurt Cobain that was brilliant was his ability to write in a way like, you know, like taking Beatles influences and other influences and, and being able to write these songs in a style that was kind of almost like a more of a punk style. You know what I mean? Yeah. But I always like the guys that are like, you know, like that are doing kind of the more, I don't want to say progressive, but like, you know, heading towards progressive. So like, you know, like Zeppelin and, and all the interesting things that Jimmy Page did with like the 12 string and like, you know, production wise and all that stuff. I like when that music has all those elements to it. So that's kind of my influence. So I think where like the Foo Fighters and Stone Temple Pilots, that's kind of like where TJ and I kind of met, I think, mm. as far as influences. Gotcha. But from a writing standpoint, I really only wrote like music for one song when I was in that band. Other than that, the writing was almost all TJ. I was 90, okay. 95% TJ. And I think a lot of it had to do with the fact that my, my influences were not his influences for the most part. Yeah, no, that makes I, I, I didn't mind though. I thought it was great because he was so talented. Oh, absolutely. As, as much as I love the, the eighties hair metal and everything that we're talking about, I loved last conservative and all those songs. And so like the, the riffs are so catchy and the lyrics were so great that it's like, how, how could you not, if you're just a fan of music, that's that's going to catch you. And uh, I guess from here, my next question for you, 10,000 volts is out. It's doing great. Uh, you had your hand in that. The Jack Russell songs are out. They're doing great. What's next for you? You know, right now, i um, hoping to do some more stuff with Steve um, this year. And then other than that, just continue to write and, and, you know, find other avenues for songs. You know, if the stuff's right for a project Steve's working on, you know, I'm happy to give those to Steve. If, if, if there's something else that comes up that's different uh, stylistically or something else, uh, you know, just for me, it's all about um, trying to improve what I can do as a writer because the first dozen years or so, you know, and, and I probably have been seriously writing for the last like maybe five or six, mm-hmm. but those years are just, we're all about like, okay, like with my first band, this is pre last conservative. It was about like, who are the record label guys? How do I get this? How do I hustle to get this? I was very, I very much hustled, but the kind of the cart before the horse. It was like business before the art. Yeah. With this type of stuff, it's always the art before the business. It's always like, I want the songs to be great. 
and then when they're great, I shop them to people. So that's kind of what I've been doing and, and talking with writers and just talking with writers, not even just to pitch them my ideas, but to try to get them that like bigger writers to just to help me with my ideas, to try to always improve. I think that my, the quality of my demos are like really pretty good now, but it's more mm-hmm. about taking it to that next level in terms of the musical ideas. And then also with melodies and, and, you know, I'm not really a lyric guy, but as far as melodies, I do have a lot of ideas, but even Steve's help. Steve has helped me with this and the few things I've sent him melodically. He's, you know, he'll give me pointers on like, you know, what's good and what's not and, and how things build within a song and how, you know, how it works. So, that's really my goal is to spend a lot of time working on that. And then, you know, every time I get a new batch of songs, I just kind of send them out to people and say, Hey, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? And I, I like doing that. I mean, technology has allowed us to be able to do that kind of thing and, and be yeah. able to kind of, I mean, I, I, I didn't meet Steve Brown in person until after 10,000 volts is out. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I've never been in the same room with him and I didn't meet a, I met Ace like, a couple months before 10,000 volts came on. So, but, wow. but I, I didn't even meet Steve until after it was out. Wow. So That's the fact amazing. that you can kind of write over, you know, or do interviews like this or mm-hmm. write over the technology. It's, it's just great because you can just pass files around and, and work and it's a great way to collaborate. And it's, you know, being in Buffalo, it's, you know, it's been great for me too, because <laughs> what I noticed is pre COVID if you were trying to write with somebody in Nashville and you didn't live in Nashville or you went down there at least a decent amount of time, they want nothing to do with you because you're an outsider. Right. (laughs) And I think that's probably changing. But at the time I started trying to write with people, I mean, I ended up writing with a guy who did, who wrote a hit with uh, Thomas Rat, right. The country Mm -hmm. guy. And, but I probably sent stuff to like a hundred different writers and gotten, and and the first question is, is, Oh, you down in Nashville? And I'm like, no. And then they'd be like, well, and then I had to start going to Nashville and, and being there regularly. Right. So it's yeah. like, you know, that's the thing is like with rock eyes, I, I don't know. There's, there's, it's just like, Hey, what does it sound like? And if it's good, it's good. You know, there's less of that hesitancy to work with someone that's from the outside because with rock eyes, we're everywhere, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so 10,000 volts, and you know the jack russell stuff is now out it's uh, so i want everybody to go check those out of course but i guess my my final question to you would be now that those things are you know out with your name on them is it making that process that you're telling me about a little bit easier because your resume is growing with names like jack russell and ace freely yes and no it, it makes it easier from the standpoint of when you send stuff to people, you have a a nice credit that, you know, like, Hey, I worked with, you know, I worked on these songs with Steve and Ace and, or I worked on this song with uh, Jack Russell and Tracy Guns, these songs that they did. Um, so it makes it easier to get yourself listened to, like people will listen to it more, but you still have to hustle in this. You know what I mean? It's not people, people aren't going to just start calling and say, Hey, I see your name on here. I mean, you get a lot of Facebook friend requests through it from musicians but in terms of actually having, being able to write out other projects. I mean, I think you're still kind of, uh, you know, master of your own destiny in terms of getting out there and having to really hustle to, to make it happen. And yeah, uh, I, I tend to hustle, so I don't, I don't mind that, but yeah, it's, um, but it is nice because now you have like before was, you know, Hey, I'm, I'm a writer, but I didn't really have any credits. Whereas now I've got a couple of decent credits and, and one of them that's a really good credit. So, you know, or two mm-hmm. of them actually that are really good credits. I mean, I've done some smaller things where mm-hmm. I have to explain to people like, Oh, this is the guy who knows the guy who used to play with this guy. You know what I mean? And it's like, <laughs> yeah, it's like the Kevin Bacon game to try to get them to realize that it's, you know, now you just say, well, it's Ace Freely or it's Jack Russell, you know, and they just go, Oh yeah. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and, and then you can point them to the actual song, which is nice too. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. No, well, it's, you- it's nice. You touched on, uh, you know, the friend request thing. So before I get you out of here, uh, can we have you plug your social media so people can find you and follow you? And then, you know, whatever you end up doing next, you can you can plug it to your your new followers. That would be great. Um, it's David Julian Music. So it's just my name, no space with music. Um, that's my Instagram. Um, that's probably the best way to, to kind of touch base if, if people want to get in touch. And um, yeah, you know, I keep that pretty up to date with. Yeah, things that are going on. 
Okay, cool. Well, man, thank you again for being here. This was a really cool interview. And I, I love just how much knowledge you have of music in general. And I don't get a lot of musicians on here who name drop like Warren D. Martini. And that made me like fanboy out a little bit because I was like, ah, oh, love that guy. <laughs> yeah, the number of times that I've probably practiced and played, uh, I can't, it's, you know, it's funny. There's, there's probably three bands where I know I don't play them anymore. Mm -hmm. I don't really play cover songs, but like when I was a kid, like, I mean, you want to talk, like I was playing, talk about Warren D. Martini. I was, I was learned, not only learning songs off of out of the cellar and invasion of your privacy. I went back with a vinyl version of the EP with Tawny Katane's legs on it. Yeah. And, um, learned like you got it. And like, you know, uh, their version of like walking the dog and like, you know, the, the other version of back for more. I mean, I was really deep into it with Warren <laughs> D. Martini. So, you know, that's, I'm, I'm a big fan. I mean, I, I did that obviously with Van Halen. I did it with uh, ACDC um, and I did it with the Randy Road stuff. So with those four, I mean, it was like, you know, I didn't just learn the hits. It was like, I learned like everything I could learn. I would work on every song they ever put out. So yeah, those are, those are big influences. And then, you know, later with the Frampton and, 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 um, you know, Jimmy Page stuff and, you know, Jeff Beck and, you know, even got into like, you know, my dad was into like Wes Montgomery, who's like a jazz guitarist and George Benson mm -hmm. and like jazz stuff and like all different types of things. But yeah, that's Warren D. Martini is always going to be on the route Mount Rushmore for me, for sure. I'm hoping one day I run into Warren D. Martini somewhere and he'll just be like, hey, thanks, man. You know, I, I hear he's very nice, but he's he's you know he's not really uh, out there as much but it's funny every time i see any little snippet of an interview or like wait he's going to be at rock I'm, I'm thinking i might have even though i can play i might mm -hmm. have to just like and i've played some shows and stuff i might have to just like sign up for rock and roll fantasy camp just to meet him because <laughs> a lot of times you know it's guys that maybe used to play in bands and, and whatever and and all this mm -hmm. and, and i used to play in a band too but, yeah yeah you know, but I, I, you know, the, the rock and roll fan, like, however I, whatever I have to do to meet him, I might have to just do that and like explain well, to my wife why I'm, I'm, I'm spending thousands of dollars to go play <laughs> with, uh, with Warren D. Martini. And I'm like, well, I'm never going to meet him otherwise, you know? Well, Britt Lightning is a really good friend of mine. So if, if she brings Warren into rock and roll fantasy camp, I'll have to let you know. <laughs> let me know. I, you know what, I'll, whatever I got to pay to get in there, you know, if my, if my kid's got to you know, not go to college, whatever it takes. <laughs> <laughs> I just need to, I need to meet Warren Martini. but his playing and just what he did for me was, you know, because Eddie and Randy came earlier, right. And as far yeah. as, and he came you know, a few years later and I just, the energy and his playing and the way he did things and his vibrato and everything, it's just, uh, <laughs> just incredible. And I, I do believe if I remember this correctly, a, a year or two ago, they did have him at rock and roll fantasy camp. I think I'll, I'll have did. to ask. No, no, they did. They did. Yeah, okay. He was actually just there recently, I think, because I saw a video of him playing You're in Love and he was oh, okay. playing with a bunch of other guys. And people kept, you know, I mean, the people that are there that are paying all that money to go to rock and roll fantasy camp, I think it's yeah. an amazing experience. I mean, it really is. I think it's awesome. But, yeah. you know, if somebody wants to take the solo on You're in Love, obviously they just, you know, they did the solo. And then mm -hmm. what they did with Warren is at the end of the song, he, they just let him jam for a while and everyone. You know, it's kind of like everybody's kind of facing forward, but they're all looking at him. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because yeah. you can't help it. I mean, the guy's just incredible. So, you know, it was one of those things where, like, the guy plays the solo, the camera goes to the guy that's at the fantasy camp playing the solo, and then all of a sudden the camera pans over to Warren and he solos for, like, two minutes at the end of You're in Love, and everybody's just kind of, like, you know, looking at it, checking it out. But, um, you know, I, I would literally just I, – that would be amazing just to be able to be in that room with him and, and be able to do that. Just, yeah, so no, maybe. I really appreciate uh, coming on here and I definitely uh, I'll let you know kind of what I got going on in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And again, I, I urge all my uh, listeners to uh, follow you on Instagram and uh, see for themselves what you got going on. So, all right. Thanks again, man. Thanks, Robbie. Take care. Thank you once again for joining me on the All Bets Are Off podcast. 
truly appreciate all you listeners. And if you were here for the first time, I hope you liked what you heard. And just another reminder to not only follow us on social media, but to give us a five-star review on your favorite podcast app. Thanks, guys, and we will catch you next time. The preceding presentation has been brought to you by the Gear Network.